Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on glutamate signaling. And in this video, what we're going to do is discuss um, the uh, kinate receptors. Okay, so um, we've um, been discussing so far the ionotropic glutamate receptors. And the first video in the playlist, we saw that ionotropic receptors could be uh, subdivided into four different categories, namely the AMPA receptors, which was the first main category that we looked at, then the NMDA receptors, NMDA receptors, then what we had is these kinate receptors, and then a bunch of receptors that we don't really know much about at all, which are the uh, delta glu receptors. Okay, right. So, in this video, what we're going to concentrate on is these kinate receptors. Right, so they have a very similar structure to the AMPA receptors. So if I draw one in a cell membrane here, so here is the phospholipid bilayer, and then it's a four subunit structure. So it's a structure made out of four subunits, like so. And these subunits, um, there are many genes coding for these subunits, basically. So here is a, um, a kinate receptor sitting in the membrane, and it's made up of these four subunits. And uh, there are five genes coding for kinate receptor subunits, and those are the GLU-K1 gene, the GLU-K2 gene, and it goes on, GLU-K3, GLU-K4, and then finally, GLU-K5. Okay, and uh, just like in the case of AMPA receptors, you can make heterotetramers and you can make homotetramers. So a homotetramer is where you use a single one of these uh, in all four positions, basically, to make your kinate receptor. A heterotetramer is where you use two different types, and uh, the two and so you've got four subunits overall that you need to put in. If you're using two different types, then there are two ways that you could do it. You could either have three of one and then one of the other, or you could have two of one and two of the other. And the way nature does it is it has two of one and two of the other, and it puts them in the same way as the AMPA receptor. It puts them diagonally opposite one another. Okay, so basically, homotetramers are going to consist of four of these same subunits all together. And so if I just colour in to show that they're all the same, so all of these are exactly the same uh, subunit, i.e. they're coded for by the same gene, they are the same polypeptide. Okay, and, um, and a heterotetramer will be where you have... Uh, two of these subunits coded for by one of these genes, and the other two will be coded for by the other gene, like so. So this is a heterotetramer here. So I'll just annotate them. This is a homotetramer, this orange one here, and that mixed one is a heterotetramer. And there are only certain homo and heterotetramers allowed. So not every single one of these is allowed to make a homotetramer, and not every single heterotetramer you could think of is allowed. So there is again a nice diagram for remembering which homotetramers and which heterotetramers, i.e. which kinate receptors are overall allowed. So you put glue K1 up at the top, you then put glue K2 to the side here, glue K3 at the bottom, then you put glue K4 here, and then finally glue K5 here. And then the way you make the diagram is you connect up all of this like this so that it's nicely symmetric, so that you have three of these lines going down like so. Okay, put nodes in the middle of those to denote that these are the heterotetramers that are allowed. So these are all of the heterotetramers allowed. So you can make a heterotetramer out of glue K1 and glue K2, because there is a node in between it. You can make a heterotetramer between glue K1 and glue K4, because there is a node between it. You are not allowed to make a heterotetramer between glue K1 and glue K3, because there is no connection between them on this diagram. Okay, so let's put an example in for this. So you can have glue K5 with glue K3. So let's say these pink ones are glue K5s and these orange ones are glue K3s. Here's another glue K3, and this one finally is a glue K5. Okay, uh, right.
Now to show the homotetramers that are allowed on this diagram. Well, basically, just put lines up from all of these ones, which again keeps the diagram nicely sort of symmetrical. Um, and those are the homotetramers allowed. So you're allowed to form a homotetramer of glue K2, you're allowed to form a homotetramer of glue K4, and you're allowed to form a homotetramer of glue K5, but not of glue K1 or glue K3. So you are allowed to form one, let's say, which one should we use? Well, we'll use glue K2. So you're allowed to form a homotetramer of glue K2s. Right, so now, uh, now we've looked at how you assemble tetramers of K-mate receptors. Let's look at the uh, transmembrane, well, the membrane-spanning uh, topology of a single subunit. So let's say we take out a single subunit, say glue K1, and let's have a look at its membrane-spanning topology. And basically, what you find is that uh, it's got a very similar membrane-spanning topology to AMPA, in fact, identical, <laughs> almost identical. They are encoded for by different genes, but they are very similar to AMPA receptors, uh, subunits, these. Uh, so the uh, membrane-spanning topology is as follows. The amino terminus is extracellular, so it starts off up there, and then it spans the membrane a single time, and then it has a loop which tries to span the membrane but doesn't succeed, and then it has another transmembrane domain, and then finally a final membrane trans trans spanning domain. Okay, and then the carboxyl terminus stays in the cytosol here. So this is the cytosolic side, and this is the extracellular uh, aspect here. Okay, so again, these, uh, these domains, these membrane-spanning domains have names. So this first membrane-spanning domain is M1. This loop which fails to span the membrane is M2. This third membrane-spanning domain is M3, and this fourth membrane-spanning domain is M4. Okay, and again, just like in the case of AMPA, the, um, the, um, a portion of the amino terminus prior to M1 and a portion of the M3, M4 loop here uh, adhere together. They bind together and they form the ligand binding domain. So the ligand binding domain is a portion here which aggregates together and forms the ligand binding domain, which is often abbreviated to LBD. So this is the ligand binding domain. Okay, right. Uh, where am I going to put this? Domain. Okay, or LBD for short. So LBD, you often see in short. So, okay, now let's just have a bit of discussion of the kinetics of these um, receptors. So, uh, let's say we've got a a kinate glutamatergic receptor down here in our membrane and it's made up of four subunits and the it could be any one of these ones I don't really uh, mind which one we choose to use it could be a homotetramer or it could be a heterotetramer just as long as it's one of the ones that is allowed by this diagram Okay, so uh, we each one of these subunits, each one of these sub four subunits that comprises the tetrama, whether it's a homo or heterotetrama, each one of those has its own ligand binding domain. So each one of these cylinders is one of these things up here. So each one has an extracellular ligand binding domain. Now that means that four glutamate molecules have to come in bind to this kinate receptor because one glutamate has to bind to this ligand binding domain. Uh, one glutamate has to bind here to this uh, subunit's ligand binding domain, another one to this subunit's ligand binding domain, and finally another one to that ligand binding uh, ligand uh, that subunit's ligand binding domain. So you therefore need four glutamate molecules to come and activate this receptor. So when four glutamate molecules have bound to the kinate receptor, one to each of the subunits of the kinate receptor, then uh, the receptor will change conformation and it will open, and a pore will open through. Uh, this um, kinate receptor. So it will open and it will then become permeable to monovalent cations. Okay, so uh, it's mainly permeable to monovalent cations rather than divalent cations. So it likes to conduct uh, things like sodium and potassium rather than, in fact, sodium is usually higher extracellularly. So I draw the sodium ion on the outside. It likes to conduct sodium and likes to conduct potassium. It doesn't really like having to conduct calcium. Calcium is a divalent cation because it has two positive charges rather than one. 
Okay, but these kinate receptors are not terribly permeable to divalent cations. Okay, so when this opens, and let's say it opens at minus 65 millivolts, so uh, glutamate has come along, the cell was at resting membrane potential, so at minus 65 millivolts. What is generally going to happen is that uh, the net movement of positive charge is going to be inwards. So you're going to get a movement of sodium into the cell. You're also probably going to get a move, you're going to get a little bit of movement of potassium out of the cell. But basically, the amount of positive charge you move outwards in the form of potassium is going to be smaller than the amount of positive charge you move inwards in the form of sodium. So overall, you get a net movement of positive charge into the cell. Okay, and that then leads to depolarization, basically. So if we plot, if what we now want to look at is we want to look at how these receptors insensitize because we've seen that NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors both insensitize and the same is true of kinate receptors. So let's plot this graph that we've seen many times before which is a graph of the current going from intracellular to extracellular as a function of time. So let's say we done exactly what we just did as an experiment. We put glutamate onto this kinate receptor here, and the uh, resting membrane potential was across the cell, so it was minus 65 millivolts prior to us adding the glutamate. Now the glutamate is bound to the um, ligand binding domains of each one of these uh, subunits of the kinate receptor, and the kinate receptor has opened, and it's now allowing a net positive current into the cell. So you have a current moving from the extracellular domain to the intracellular domain. Uh, sorry, the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment. That's a current moving in the opposite direction to the way we are measuring current. We are measuring current moving intracellular to extracellular. So that will show up as a negative current on our graph. So what you'll get, basically, is you'll get an initial negative current and then it will stop very, very quickly. You'll get a graph that looks like this if you plot current versus time. And it's because this, this kinate receptor actually closes very quickly. It insensitizes to glutamate very, very rapidly. Okay, so it undergoes insensitization. And if we compare this, um, this graph to the graph for insensitization, Insensitization. Okay, that's fine. Insensitization. That doesn't look right, though. Okay, um, so it undergoes insensitization to glutamate, and it closes even though the glutamate is still bound. And that's the process known as insensitization. Okay, now if we compare the graph of kinate receptors to glutamate receptors, uh, sorry, to AMPA receptors, uh, then... Um, what you see is if this, imagine now that this receptor was an AMPA receptor, so this is the graph for kinate receptors, kinate receptors, and they're often uh, written K-A-R for short, kinic acid receptor in short, in full. Okay, uh, so imagine now that it's an AMPA receptor, glutamate has come and bound, the membrane potential was minus 65 millivolts, so we still get a net movement of positive charge into the cell. But for AMPA, the graph looks something more like this, basically. So that's what AMPA looks like. So the actual current that AMPA receptors are capable of conducting is greater than the uh, current that kinate receptors are capable of conducting. But they have similar inactivation kinetics. They close very, very rapidly. And to remind you of what it is for NMDA, if I draw finally what it is for NMDA, I'll put this in green. Uh, so for NMDA, it looks something more like this, so much slower in activation kinetics. So this is NMDA receptors. Okay, um, and then again, you can uh, denote that NMDARs for receptors. Right, uh, so uh, kinate has a different, uh, a yet again, different kinetics to the other two types of receptors. Its inactivation is very similar to AMPA receptors, but it does have a lower maximum current that it can allow through uh, than the AMPA receptors. Okay, and another piece, another important uh, thing to add is why is it called the kinic receptor? Well, it's because uh, this molecule, kinic acid, is an extremely potent um, is an extremely potent agonist for this receptor. 
Kainic acid will bind to the ligand binding domains uh, of these four subunits. So four kainic acid molecules will come along and one will bind to each of these ligand binding domains. And that will cause the receptor to open just as though glutamate was there. And basically kainic acid is actually very dangerous because it leads to a complete overexcitation of neurons in the brain. And uh, that can actually lead to excitotoxicity of neurons. So it's not a nice chemical at all. Um, and that's all I've got to say, really, on K8 receptors.